Well, good evening on our last week together. There's my first person. Yay, it's working. Tonight, it's working tonight. Hey, Dawn. Hey, Alta Gracia. Well, y'all are jumping on. Hi, Peggy. How are ya? Sally's on here. Karen. Angie. Terry. Well, y'all are coming on tonight. So, what a blessing it is. I love to see your names. I just wish I could see you in person. I just wish that I could be with all of you, but one of these days we'll be together. We'll be together in heaven. Okay, well, since, um, oh, hold on, I just gotta get rid of that. I don't know how to get rid of it. Where'd I go? There I am. There we go. So, alrighty, let me just open with a word of prayer so we can get going. Oh, Lord in heaven, we just come before you, and we just come right into the throne room of God, where you are seated at the right hand of your Father, Jesus. And we just want to give you all the glory and all the praise for all that you've done. And what a blessing it is, Lord, to have studied this incredible book. And now we come to the conclusion tonight of Revelation. Thank you, Father, for how your people have continued and how they have grown and how they have loved their study. Thank you, Father, that they have not given up and that some of them are still uh, plotting through it, but they ha are determined to not give up, Lord. I pray that you will help them to persevere through this difficult study, Lord. Thank you for what you've taught us. Thank you for unveiling uh, truths to us that we never knew. Thank you for giving us your divine plan ahead of time, Lord. Thank you for all that you teach us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding us and for speaking this message tonight. And we ask all of these things in your most precious name, amen. Wow, great, great, great. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I've been so excited tonight because, I mean, I'm not excited that we're ending, but I was just excited because I love to be with all of you. I just love you all so much. Okay, so we come to the conclusion of Revelation. And I've heard some incredible things, and um, I've heard that people have just grown so much. They've learned things. They've They've, they, I mean, what God has done in all of our hearts is truly amazing. And obviously, I can't know it um, because, you know, what God is doing in your heart, you may keep to yourself, um, but only you know. And only God knows what, uh, what you're going through and what, you've, what you have gained from this Bible study. Okay, so as I was just thinking over Revelation and I was thinking about just what I wanted to share with you, here's some thoughts that came to my mind and these thoughts actually came to my mind as we were studying this book of the Bible. So the first one is this, is that the Word of God tells us everything we need to know. And so sometimes we go, well, you know, does it say this, or does it say this, or how come, how come God doesn't tell us this? Well, He has given us everything that we need to know. He's given us all of that. And um, we also need to study it. We need to study it, and obviously you know that I am an advocate for Bible study. Absolutely, because that's what changed my life. That's what helped me grow, even when I, even after I went to five years to Bible college, I never imagined, I never imagined that I would need Bible study so much. And then when I was invited to go to a precept Bible class, 
oh my goodness, everything inside of me changed. So I have become an advocate and ambassador for Kingdom Bible Studies, obviously. Okay, uh, the third thing is, is that, and, and this is something that has really been hitting me a lot lately, is that the name of Jesus is a power that we need to utilize, but we often don't. So, um, you know, we can see, we can see how Jesus is the subject all the way throughout scripture, all the way to the very end, and that he is the one seated on the throne next to his father. And his name, it says in, um, it says in Philippians that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father at the name of Jesus. And I want to remind you that when you speak the name, incredible things happen. So I want, I want to encourage you to go through to every day to just speak the name of Jesus. If someone needs, if someone needs a touch of the garment, the, the, the royal garment of Jesus, if someone needs to be encouraged, if someone needs to be comforted, if someone needs advice, speak the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is healing in and of itself. I know it sounds kind of crazy and kind of cliche-ish, but, but just do it because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And so I want to encourage you to speak the name out loud. Speak it out loud as much as you can. Say the name of Jesus and even for your own self. And then let me know and then and then let me know what God does through that. So there's two things that became evident to me as we were studying Revelation. Is that number one is that we need to examine our lives we need to do an evaluation of our lives periodically and then we need to live the way the Bible tells us to live. So examine our lives and live the way that the Bible tells us to live. And then number two is we need to worship Jesus foremost every single day. Worship of Jesus should be our number one priority. He deserves it. Don't you agree? He so deserves it. Let me see those hearts. He so deserves it. He deserves our worship. So I want you to make worship because in the heavens, when we get to heaven, we are going to see, we are going to see Jesus like we've never seen before. And we are going to be worshiping along with the angels, along with everybody. We're going to be worshiping. So, uh, and then, and then here's another thought that came to me that God's plan will capital W-I-L-L, -L, will go forward no matter how much his enemies try to stop it. So we need to always keep that in mind, especially when it looks like evil's going to win, when it looks like Satan's going to win, when it looks like corruption's going to win. We need to say that out loud. Jesus, you are going to win. Truth always wins. God's plans will go forward no matter what. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what Satan tries to do. It doesn't matter. It will go forward. And then lastly is this, and this will be a good introduction into the word that I would like to bring before you tonight. So lastly is that we find this out in the, in the very um, end conclusion of Revelation is that Jesus is coming soon. Now I know that we learned, we learned that, you know, every generation has, has believed that, that it was their generation that Jesus was going to come back. But I believe that there is more evidence in the world today, all the things that we're seeing, more evidence of, of, ever, 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 that Jesus is really coming back very, very soon. And so how do we know this? Um, well, this leads us into my, the word that I'd like to bring before you tonight. So as we're living, living in the world in which we're living right now, um, which it's not the same world that I grew up in, it's probably not the same world that you grew up in either, and as we're living here, we should ask our question, we should ask ourselves this question. 
What should be our focus? What should be our focus? What should we keep our eyes fixed on? What should we keep our eyes fixed on as we wait for our bridegroom to come back? As we wait for our bridegroom to come back. So I have five things, five things that I'd like to share with you tonight that we need to keep our eyes on. Okay, the number, the first thing is that we need to keep our eyes on the signs. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, you know, I don't really think it's that important to look at the signs. Well, I want to tell you something. There was a day when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives and, and he had been talking about the, the temple and how it was going to be destroyed and the disciples were sitting with him and these, this encounter happens in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. That is the most detailed account of it. It's also in Mark and um, I, I believe Luke, but, but this is the most detailed one. And we call it the Olivet Discourse. And this is where Jesus literally went through and gave the signs. And this is what he said in Matthew 24, verse 4. So, well, let me back up. Verse 3. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And then Jesus told them, and Jesus laid out for them signs that they can look for. Now, if we were not to keep our eyes on the signs, if it wasn't that important, Jesus wouldn't have told us to do that, right? Okay, so we need to look at the signs. So what are those signs? Well, first of all, and, and of course, there's lots of them that Jesus um, lists, but I want to talk about some that we are seeing so evident in our world today. But before I even get into that, I want to talk to you just a little bit about signs because we have to be cautious about signs, especially those that are date setters. And those people that say, oh, well, Jesus is going to come back, you know, and even if, even if they look at the Jewish calendar and they say, oh, well, this happened and this happened, and so it has to be on this date. Well, I want to, I want to remind you that Jesus said that no one, no one is going to know when he's going to come back. And also, I want to remind you to not let anyone tell you that looking at the signs or talking about the signs of the end days is dumb or stupid or whatever because the Bible disagrees with you. The Bible disagrees with that analogy. So, and signs are like time clocks. In fact, in, Deut in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, and you know that Daniel is um, not just an Old Testament prophetic book, but, it's, uh, but it also prophesies I mean, it didn't just prophesy for the, that day in which they lived, but, you know, a lot of people believe that Daniel and Revelation go side by side, and in a lot of ways they do, because a lot of the, the revelations that Daniel received hundreds and hundreds of years before, before John was exiled to the island of Patmos, and he received the, the vision that we have in Revelation, um, those, those uh, revelations... Uh, coincide with each other they coincide with each other um, and so in Daniel chapter 12 verse 4 he lists two signs that would be evident in the end days and that is this the increase in travel and knowledge the increase in travel and knowledge and I know that you can look at our world today and you can say oh my goodness yes and it even says in Daniel that people will be going here and there and going all over the world. Well, it really does happen that way. In fact, in 1914, the average speed of cars and trucks was 15 to 20 miles per hour. But today, with rockets and satellites, we average over 24,000 miles per hour miles per hour so and and it's even more than that because I got that statistic from an old statistic so it's even more than that so just multiply that by 10 or something I don't know but anyways um, 
And obviously these two signs go hand in hand because there had to be knowledge in order to create the travel. You know, math minds and all that kind of stuff. So there had to be knowledge. But I know that you know that we can say for sure that travel and knowledge has surely increased more in the 20th century than ever before, than ever before. Here's a few other signs that are so prevalent and we see them. And one of the things that Jesus talks about in the Olivet Discourse is deception. He doesn't just say it once. He says it many times. Listen to this. In, uh, in 24.4, he says this. Um, he says, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. In verse 11 of that same chapter, and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. In uh, verse 24, he says, For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. And we're seeing that so, so evident within the world today. Now, when we think about deception, we often think about the blatant deception that, that all of us could agree with that all of us could agree with. I mean, we can look at things like other religions, world religions, and we can say, no, 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 no. That is not, that doesn't even add up. That doesn't even compare to Christianity, not at all. Like for instance, the New Age, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, Buddhism, Islam, which is the second largest religion in the world, right beyond Christianity. It's pretty scary. Hinduism. So those, those world religions, we can say, oh, no way. You know, I can't even imagine a Christian, a, a born-again Christian, being deceived by those religions. However, the deception is not just blatantly before us. It is very subtle as well. In fact, subtle deception is rampant, and it has not just invaded the world, but it's invaded the church. It's invaded the church. And so um, here's, here's a few things that are happening within the framework of the church. So first of all, many believers, many leaders are questioning certain, certain mainstream doctrines or they're reinterpreting the mainstream doctrines to fit into their modern world. Now, that is not God's plan for the Word of God. That is not God's plan for the church. You know, these, these doctrines have been the foundation of the church and have been a part of church doctrine for many, 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 many years. And so many of them are questioning it. Like, for instance, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We know that the Bible was inspired. We know that while over 40 men wrote the Bible, the Holy Spirit inspired every one of them. I mean, my goodness, my goodness. You know, um, and I remember, um, and I've, I've shared this before, there's, there's a man, um, an, an apologetic, that came to my church uh, once. His name is Norm Geisler. He just uh, passed away not too long ago. He was in his 70s. And I remember him saying that he had spent his entire life his entire life, from the time he was a teenager, coming against so-called contra contradictions in the Bible. And he said, you know what? I'm 70, over 70 years old, and I can say that there's not one, not one contradiction. And so every one of the so-called um, uh, differences or contradictions can be explained biblically. And so I thought that was pretty amazing, considering the Bible was written by over 40 men. But some of the leaders are questioning the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they're questioning um, homosexuality. You know, um, they're, they're trying to fit in with this. They're trying to fit their church into the modern world. And obviously we know that homosexuality is a huge thing these days. And so, you know, some of them are going, you know what, I thought it was a sin, 
until I met some gay people. I thought it was a sin until I met some gay people. I mean, I've heard that come out of Christian mouths. They're questioning hell. They're questioning hell. You know, if God is such a loving God, how can he send people to hell? Well, you and I know that hell is very real, especially after studying Revelation. We know that. And we know that the Bible talks specifically about two places, two eternal places, either heaven or hell. And God doesn't send people to hell. People do because they reject Jesus Christ. They've been given the opportunity to know him and they have rejected him. So they have chosen their own eternal condemnation. And churches are also questioning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they're questioning sin. God wouldn't punish, punish sinners because he's a God of love. So they take out all the passages that deal with sin. Or they don't talk about sin. They don't make people come to grips with their sinful uh, desires, their fleshly desires in their self. And then, of course, certain end time prophecies. Certain end time prophecies, like the rapture and the millennium. There's, there's many churches that um, have questioned those things and they, they won't teach those things because they're doubting those things. Okay, so deception has invaded the church. Here's another thing that's happening within the church is that the church is often putting social justice above sin and redemption. So this is what they're saying. We don't need to preach the gospel. We just need to show love by bringing justice to the oppressed and provision to the needy. And I want to remind you that the Bible says that we are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are his ambassadors. And yes, while we are to show love and, and, and help the people that are oppressed, we're also to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's another thing, um, is that the church, and I've seen this so many times, I've seen this so much, is that the, um, the church is believing in this universalism. So they're believing, they're somehow believing that, that everyone that, is, that believes in God is going to heaven, is going to heaven. So they believe in, in, in the fact that we all worship the same God. But I wanna remind you that the Bible says, in fact, Jesus says, that the road to heaven is narrow and the road to destruction is wide and that there's a gate, there's a gate and Jesus is standing at the gate and you cannot get through the gate into eternal life in heaven without coming through Jesus. That's what the Bible says and we have to believe in the authority of scripture, the authority of scripture. I remember Years ago, when my kids were young, I was the Southeast Michigan coordinator for Moms in Touch. If any of you know what Moms in Touch is, it is a, a group of moms that gather together from their particular school to pray for their kids. It's, it's, it was a great, and it still is, a great way for us to bring prayer back into the schools, even though we're not meeting in the schools. We're meeting in homes and all of that stuff. And so my job was to try and get more groups to start Moms in Touch groups in the Metro Detroit area, in the Southeast Michigan area. And I remember this one day, this lady called me and she wanted to join us in prayer. And you know, usually I would be very accepting. And then she began to tell me that she was a Hindu. And I said to her, I said, well, you know, um, my problem is, is that we are not worshiping and praying to the same God. And so there can't be unity among that. When she was very offended and didn't understand it, and I said it very nice and kind, and I tried to share the gospel with her and everything, and then she, um, she left, and I'm not sure, you know, what happened, but, um, but you know, it, that is so true. Christianity is apart from other, all other religions, because no other religion believes in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the God, the second person of the Godhead, and, and 
if if they don't, then they can be considered a cult, a cult. Or if they put their book of teaching above the Bible, that's also a false religion. So there's lots of deception going through the church these days. So that's one sign. And then another sign that Jesus talks about is in Matthew 24, 12. He says this. He says, um, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. So there will be an increase of wickedness. Now this word sin that's found in the New Living Translation um, is also translated wickedness or iniquity in other translations. And the Greek word for that is anomia, A-N-O-M-I-A. And this word is interesting because what it does is it carries with it the idea of deliberately disobeying a specific standard, God's standard. So basically, it is people that are coming against, totally against God's standard. There's going, to be a, um, there's going to be an increase in this kind of wickedness in the end days. I know I don't have to tell you that you see it because I see it. In fact, um, I, I, many of you probably might not be as old as me. I'm not ancient yet, but one of these days I may be if the rapture doesn't take place soon. Um, but many of you may be a bit younger, but if we were to look back 50 years ago, what's happening in our world today that people are calling common and they're accepting it, 50 years ago, we would have gone, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. For instance, abortion on demand. People don't even bat an eye anymore about abortion. Homosexual marriage. I mean, 50 years ago, homo, well, you know, homosexuality is all the way, is, was, you know, rampant at different times during the uh, Bible days. In fact, Jesus even destroyed two cities because of it, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, but homosexual marriage, I mean, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, they were, you know, homosexuals were hiding their, their, um, their sexual identity, but there was no such thing as marrying to homosexual people. They wouldn't have, we wouldn't have even imagined that. Hate crimes. Oh my goodness, burning flags and destroying statues representing our heritage. Those things, hate crimes, corrupt government policies, and, and, and here's another one, anti-God teachings in universities today. I, my heart goes out to parents who have trained their kids and their kids have been in church and they've been active in the church and then they go to a secular university and they are there everything that they believed in is dismantled by some of the philosophies that the professors are teaching them and they are coming out either agnostic or atheist or doubting and questioning what they had grown up knowing the foundation of the church they are confused they are confused and i and i want to remind you too that some of that kind of philosophy isn't just happening in the secular universities it's also happening in some what 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 they would call christian universities so some universities that call themselves christians are not necessarily christian so we have to be really careful but i did hear one pastor recently say that Parents today should really, truly consider send if their kids are going to go to college, which most kids do, consider sending them to a reputable Christian college instead of a secular university. Um, it's just something that, you know, I, I, and I totally think that that's a great thing to think about. So uh, the anti-God teaching in universities, the mass killings, kids killing parents, disrespecting parents, um, attacking each other. And you and I know that this has become prevalent in the world in which we're living today. And it's definitely prevalent with political views, especially with the election coming up next week. 
and it's been going on, you know, for for quite a few years now. But you know, and it's like you can't even voice your opinion, especially if you're a conservative. You cannot voice your opinion without getting attacked. I mean, totally attacked. And Christians are attacking Christians, and all of that kind of thing. But but here's another thing: the attacks are also invading the church. Because I just had this experience yesterday. Um, someone had posted, and I normally don't respond on posts because, um, especially, you know, posts that, you know, are controversial or, or where people are going to be sharing their opinions and all kinds of things because it's not a safe place to be these days. But, anyways, um, someone had asked the question Do you believe that? Christians are going to go through the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And so I was reading a lot of the comments before I made a comment, and, you know, a lot of people said, no, 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 no. But a lot of people said, oh, yes, some people believe that we were in the tribulation right now, and other people believe that we were going to go halfway through, or, or we're going to be raptured at the end of tribulation or whatever. And I made a comment that, you know, it's, it's kind of sad these days that people don't know the scriptures enough and, and all of that, you know, and, um, and that, you know, I had just taught Revelation and that, you know, there's overwhelming evidence that the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. Well, some girl went on there and she just, oh my goodness, she said some very nasty things to me three different times and I and I thought you know what I'm just gonna let it go I thought about deleting my comment but then I thought no because I want other people to see you know I want other people to see that there is hate everywhere it doesn't matter what you're talking about and so obviously there is an increase in wickedness also in Matthew 24 Jesus gives all kinds of other signs Wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes, persecution, a great turning away. We're seeing that. A great, great turning away. Hate is rampant. And, Jesus said, and in the end days, right in this Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, the good news will be preached everywhere. Well, I can tell you that the good news is being preached everywhere, thanks to the Internet and other ways that we're getting the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ out there. Oh my goodness. So have you seen these things? So we definitely need to keep our eye on the signs, on the signs. The second thing that we need to keep our eye on is Israel. Is Israel. Oh my goodness. Israel is... Um, is the most important land on earth and it's only the size of New Jersey it, and the most important city on earth is Jerusalem is Jerusalem in fact here's some statistics about Israel I mean we know Israel through you know that Israel was God's chosen land for God's chosen people but here's some statistics that are so good and I'm just going to give you the passages and you can write them down because I realize that my time is running short. So Israel, the, um, it is the geographical center. It says in Ezekiel 5.5 5, that Israel will be placed in the middle of nations. And when you look at the world map, when you, when you take and you look at the whole world map, <coughs> excuse me, Israel sits right in the middle surrounded by all of these nations all of these nations ironic i don't think so it's also the revelation center and it's from this land that we got moses and the ten commandments that the prophets prophesied that the apostles came from and that we got the word of god from israel it's also the spiritual center this is where Jesus was born. He was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth. He walked and taught in Galilee. Je Jerusalem was where he died and where he was buried and where he rose from the dead. And it was the Mount of Olives that he ascended from and to the Mount of Olives is where he's going to come at the end when he returns, when he comes for his second 
return at the end of the tribulation, it says in Zechariah 14.4. It's also the prophecy center because the details of Israel's future are recorded in the Bible. And um, some, it has been said that if you want to know what God is doing, then study Israel and her people. And I so agree with that. Israel is also the storm center. Israel is the world's greatest troubled spot. And, uh, and we can see that in the daily news, in the daily news. It's also the peace center. It's also the peace center. In Psalm 122, verse 6, it, it tells us to pray for the peace in Jerusalem. So when you pray for the peace in Jerusalem, you are literally praying for the millennium to come. You're praying for the end to come because, because peace on earth will never happen until Jesus occupies Jerusalem, until he sits in the, in, the, in the temple and he reigns until the Prince of Peace is sitting in Israel. So it's also the peace center. And Israel is also, one day, will be the glory center. Israel will be the center of God's plan, of God's plan. So write this down, Isaiah 2, 3. You can go look at it later you can go look at it later so what are we to look at in these days first of all the signs and then israel and then we're to keep our eyes fixed on our unsaved community we're to pray for our loved ones without christ pray pray first before speaking always pray first the holy spirit's job is to convict remember that in john 16 5 through 8. In John 16, 5 through 8, it says that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict. A lot of people, they're like, well, I don't really know how to share the gospel. I don't really, you know, I don't know scripture enough. I mean, I grew up learning the Romans road, you know. Um, all have sinned and come fall, for, fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23 is, um, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10.13 says, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. I grew up learning that, but many people don't know uh, scripture enough. They don't know it. And so um, several years ago, um, the Metro Detroit area did um, a um, an evangelistic, um, movement. It was a it was a huge evangelistic movement. Over 500 churches and ministries jumped on board to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in our area. And one of the things that they taught people to do is just to share your story. Tell people, tell them what your life was like before you met Jesus, and what it's like since He came into your life. Just share your story. And then they, you know, and, and people are more inclined to listen anyways to your story because, because maybe they knew you before and, or, or they, or they can relate to where you were before and they want what you have. And so all you do is have to share with them your story and invite them to know Jesus. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. But I want to remind you that we are called, it says, the Great Commission is to... Uh, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Um, that's what Jesus told us. So keep your eyes on your unsaved community. Pray for them. Pray for them. Get involved with them. And then fourthly, keep your eyes fixed on how we are to be living. How we are to be living. Um, remember that we are to stay holy and pure. In fact, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was going over this ver these verses, I was really convicted. So I was just convicted because I know that I don't always use my body as a temple. And, and, and so I just want to remind you that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And so we are to keep our bodies pure and holy as we wait for Jesus Christ. We're to serve Christ and others. We're to see, serve Christ and others. In fact, um, just this weekend, I had a family member come 
um, and stay with us for a couple days and I didn't realize how bad her anxiety is and um, and I was able to share with her and she didn't know because she's a generation younger than me um, she had no clue that I went through severe anxiety as well severe panic attacks and I was able to share with her how Christ led me out of that and and what and how I found freedom and so since then I started really praying for her and you know we encouraged her to go to her doctor and talk to her doctor and I also know of a book that I think will really really help her so I ordered it she should have gotten it today and so I'm believing I told her that she was gonna and she just thanked me profusely but but when you see people struggling and you see people hurting you know just come alongside of them and help them so much and I reminded my it was my niece I reminded her that anxiety runs in our family it just runs in our family she's not the only one there's plenty of them and and um, you know and she said it was so good to know that there was somebody that could relate to her so just come alongside people serve Christ and serve others and then and then seek to know Christ more. I love what Paul said to the church at Philippians, to the church at Philippi. In Philippians 3, 7 through 8 and verse 10, he talks about, you know, he gives them his credentials of what was important to him before he had his encounter with Jesus. And once he had his encounter with Jesus, everything changed. Well, I want to remind you that everything should be changed for you too. Everything should be changed the moment that you've met Jesus and and if you are finding yourself in a rut or you're stuck or you're you're uh, apathetic in your Christian life then ask God to ignite you on fire again because everything should be changed for you because of what Jesus did for you and Paul, it was it was and then he and then he goes on and he says listen I, those things are not even important to me anymore. All of those credentials I've put behind me. The only thing that matters is that I know Jesus Christ. I seek to know him more. Do you know that when he wrote this book of Philippians, he had already been in ministry for 30 years. It was, he wrote the book of Philippians or the letter to the Philippi church was written at the very end of his ministry just before he was beheaded or uh, yeah just before he was beheaded for his faith so I think that's amazing after 30 years of planting churches and discipling people and preaching the gospel and seeing thousands come to know Jesus Christ all he wanted to do was to know Jesus more was to know Jesus more spend time in the Word of God Obviously, I'm an advocate of Bible study. And then prepare for Jesus' return. Prepare for his return. And then lastly, keep, your, keep our eyes fixed on eternity. We learned a lot about heaven, and that is the most detailed uh, description that we have in all the Bible is what is written in Revelation there's some in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about, about our new bodies and stuff like that. So just focus on those things. Focus on heaven. Keep reviewing what you've learned. Keep going over those things because that gives you hope and purpose. So let me, re let me review. What should we keep our eyes fixed on in these days? We should keep our eyes fixed on the signs watch them before our very eyes we should keep our eyes fixed on Israel we should keep our eyes fixed on our unsaved community and we should fix our eyes on how we're living how we're living do an evaluation and then on eternity we should be eternally focused eternally focused so let me close with this keep studying God's Word keep studying God's Word. It's what is going to keep you from falling into deception and believing something that's not right. Stay connected to Solid Truth Ministries because we are committed to bringing the Word of God to you through uh, blogs, through Bible studies, 
Um, the next one will probably be next fall, but I'll be doing Monday night teachings, um, the blogs. Um, you know, what I'm going to try and get those back once a week. Um, you know, different things going on as God leads us. And then share this Bible study with others. Share this Bible study with others and share this ministry. Share this video with others. Someone needs to hear it. So thank you for joining me. And it's not over yet. We still have our discussion going this week. But um, I will be praying for you. And thank you for your prayers and your support and your encouragement all the way through this. Um, it has been such a blessing to bring this Bible study to you. So have a wonderful week and stay in touch. Let me know how things are going with you.